all here and all the states uh, here today uh, putting together this nice uh, winter school. As Pierre mentioned, the case so I recently just in September moved from, from Innsbruck, so my affiliation I think on the program is in Innsbruck. I just recently moved to the Tony School, which is part of the Technical University in Vienna. So the I mean, I would like to start this um, introduction for this talk with uh, a general slide summarizing, I think, some of the main achievements from the point of uh, atomic physics over the last century, where we kind of uh, you know, not only gained our kind of new understanding how, uh, how we can use quantum mechanics to describe uh, matter and photons, but also we have developed a series of, of very uh, powerful techniques in order to control this quantum system grab them, cool them, and eventually, you know, take single quantum systems, atoms and photons, manipulate them, and let them interact and control conditions in the lab. And I think if you know, you know, probably have heard this famous uh, quote here from Schrodinger in the you know, 50s, so we will never experiment with single electrons or atoms, and I think this uh, thing puts a little bit of perspective of the things we, you know, now are used on the, or want to do too on a daily basis. So I mean, this is a, a big, uh, you know, scientific achievement. But also, uh, you know, by now we know that um, I mean, pursuing this direction and getting better and better, we might eventually up, uh, end up with you know completely new applications. So using our control of quantum systems, depending if you have you know control of many atoms here or uh, not level control, you can do you know new things which you which you have not able before. You can use this. For precision measurements, if you refer to the mass, you can build quantum simulators, maybe eventually if you really get it better better, build even a quantum computer. So this, you know, a lot of these ideas uh, I just described have really been developed in the context of AFO physics, okay? So you can, for example, apply it using jet ions, or more recently now also cold atoms in optical practices. So now that this is now a little bit going on, and, and why also most of you are here is that people now try to do the same thing using you know, not, not microscopic atoms and so on, which I've given us later, to do quantum physics, the same stuff, with kind of artificial so hand-made uh, so electric circuits and nanomechanical resonators and so on. And I mean, for those of you who are, uh, know a little bit of my work, it's, it's really also really going this direction. So think about questions of how can we actually manipulate uh, the quantum physics all the stuff that people know are doing this in this uh, AFO context, also now with this kind of artificial systems. So the topic of today's talk, however, uh, is uh, is uh, sorry. Initially, I planned to talk a little bit about mechanical, or mainly focus on non-mechanical systems. But you know, I'm a I'm a theorist, and actually, I mean, uh, from an experimental point of view, I mean, these systems are really completely different. If I look at this as a theorist, you know, as the one oscillators, two level systems, so this system becomes very similar, and actually a lot of the techniques or the, the things we, we now uh, want to do with these systems, so the concepts have, uh, a lot of concepts have been developed in this uh, AMO context, that ion physics, KD3D physics. So that is actually now to first uh, talk a little bit about, uh, especially about these giant ion systems, and another reason to do so is, of course, the CS Nobel Prize, which essentially was given to uh, two people who were, you know, among many others, uh, leading in, you know, really doing, developing these experimental methods uh, to manipulate individual quantum systems. Okay, so the plan kind of for these uh, next three lectures is so, so to use kind of this that ion system as really as a, as a toy system and explain a little bit now really the basics uh, being a little bit uh, uh, this, this type of physics you can do or people do with this strat ion physics the concepts they use to manipulate ions and come up the, the motion of the ions and then in the, in, the, in the last lecture really go to more recent research and describe a little bit how these concepts might be applicable also now to manipulate the states of microscopic systems Okay, so uh, let me uh, start this part one and first of all ask a very simple question. Okay, so we want to manipulate the ion from the quantum physics bit. We can just put it on the ground and do something with it, so we have to hold it free space in free coherence. So the first goal is to combine that ion somewhere in free space. 
And the first uh, thing, if you think about it, you, you think, okay, you're very lucky, you have, you have a charge here. It's not a neutral atom, it's a charge, and charges can be rectified into static fields. So the first idea is I make a trap by uh, trapping potential simply p times the electrostatic potential, and let's build a potential which you know is at a minimum at a certain point in space and is quadratic you know, in all the other directions. Okay, we start uh, now think about how to actually uh, arrange your electrodes to achieve this potential. You will soon uh, realize, okay, this is not so easy or it doesn't work. And the reason uh, is simply the Poisson equation. You know, so you remember Poisson equation in free space, the Laplace operator is phi zero, which you know in this expression means that these coefficients alpha, beta, and gamma must add up to zero. So in the end, okay, even if you have attractive potential in two directions, one of these coefficients must be negative. So at most, you get a seven point. So if the, the, the ion is always unstable, ion is always unstable in no one direction. Okay, this, I mean, this is well known, so there's no static uh, electric field configuration which can hold a single ion. Many people, of course, have realized this, uh, this long, uh, long while ago and have thought about solutions. And there are, in principle, two different approaches. One is uh, now called the panic trap, and this uh, was mainly developed by Demel based on some early ideas by Benny. And this simply makes, you know, you don't need to be restricted to electric fields. Okay, let's uh, use electric fields and add magnetic fields. And then you might, you know, you have some repulsion in this direction, so the ion can, cannot uh, produce these electrodes. But for only electric fields, it would escape along this direction. Now, if there's a magnetic field, you know, if uh, there's an orange force, so it will simply now move in a circle along the other two directions. The other idea is maybe uh, uh, now not so uh, immediately to get is to use, you know, instead of using static electric fields, use oscillating electric fields to try. Okay, and uh, just to, I mean, how does this work? Uh, so think about now a uh, 1D situation. You have two electrodes. You charge them up, and you apply a voltage, which is now the uh, uh, so radio frequency voltage. So you, you apply the same voltage at both traps, uh, electrodes, but you uh, make an oscillation, so it's from positive to negative. So this means the equation. So if, uh, assume that this still forms a minimum at the center of the trap. Uh, you get kind of now equation of motion, so that the, uh, the, the, the particle feels a force, which is now oscillating very rapidly in time. Okay? So, and if you think about the situation, so you have for, if these are negatively charged, the ion, uh, positively charged, the ion will be attracted to the center. At a later period, you know, it will repel from the center, and then even later, next period, it will be attracted again. And you know, the first, uh, if you look at this configuration, the first uh, idea is okay, this potential simply averages out and it don't get anything. But if you have uh, a little bit closer look, and which I'll uh, try to illustrate here briefly, you know, suppose the, the ion at some stage is here very close to the center and feels this repulsive force. Okay? It will feel a little kick outwards. So now it moves outwards, and in the next period, uh, it, it's an attractive force, but now the ion already sits a little bit farther away. So the force going back is actually larger than the force outwards. Okay? So this, if you're now clever and some fine tuning, can lead to an effect uh, confinement. So this can be also made a little bit more complicatedly. So you can, you know, this equation of motion I wrote before, this is actually known as the Mathieu equation. You probably have heard about it, found this in some form. It appears in many areas of physics. And this uh, it's also well known, it has some bound solutions. Uh, in the case where you know this, this coupling here is not too large and where this field really oscillates very fast. So you can write down this, this, this type of motion here, just uh, illustrate it how it looks like. So if, if you have a closer look, so there is one uh, large amplitude and very slow oscillation. And this I mean, people usually call it secular motion. And you see that, you know, starting from a high frequency oscillation, this gives now a scale, a uh, frequency scale, which is, is much smaller than the original frequency. And for typically experiments, it will be in a few megahertz okay. And on top of it, you know, because we are, uh, the whole thing is, is driven by these fast oscillations, 
So on top of it, the eye still follows this course, which is certainly uh, applied. But you know, it has very time to really adjust to it. So this will just give some small wiggles on top of it. Okay, so this is uh, usually called the micro motion, which sits on top of this established frequency. And now you see, you know, this, if you now don't look in too much detail, this now really looks like a harmonically trapped particle. And that's kind of the basic idea behind this forecast. So there are different, you know, a lot of different configurations. So there's a ring trap, a linear trap, so we'll come back to this, this configuration later. And more recently, people now really try, you know, to, for example, here, so to take these electrodes and put them all on, on the chip. So for better scalability, eventually, you know, fab really fabricating large arrays of these chips. Okay, so one question, okay, so this was now very, you know, this classic, uh, this part of classic motion. But in the end, I'm you know interested in quantum physics of this trapped iron. And you know, the question is, and okay, now I go to this, the same sy system, but add some scary heads here and there. You cannot scare by heads, okay, you might get worried work, work because I'm now a Newtonian, which has these large fast oscillating terms, there's no energy conservation and so on. And the question is, you know, also, does this all work also in the quantum machines? And you know, just to give you a brief glimpse, I mean why is uh, a brief hint, why does it still work? This is the easier thing is to now take this Hamiltonian and look at the Heisenberg equation of motion, which you know are very similar to the classical case. So they lead for the Heisenberg position operator to the same equation of motion. So this, to solve this, this guy can kind of make now an annotated guess. So I write my position operator as something which you know looks like a zero point motion, an oscillator, I have my A and A daggers, so I introduce the sort of uh, Called reference oscillator. So, annihilation and creation operators, they are now independent of time and obey the usual commutation relations. And then I have, of course, some, some time dependence, and if I put plug this answer back into this equation, I find that this is a solution if this u and u, u star obey the classical, uh, so the classical material equation. So, this function again captures the physics of this low oscillation, and on top of this, this small micro. So now, I mean, ha having this type of description, you can say, I mean, I take now this oscillator, like in, you know, it's doing quantum physics one, you can, having this uh, relation creator operation, you can define ground states by this relation, you can construct number states by, you know, uh, this usual formula, and you can define arbitrary position states, so as, as you're used to from a harmonic oscillator. And for calculating matrix elements, you know, it's defined if you do this uh, calculating the matrix element as a position operator, you find again this, this, this formula, which is, you know, really the same as in the standard harmonic oscillator. And then, of course, on top of it, you find some, some corrections, which now have this super large frequency. But on one hand, you know, for this stable parameter regime, these guys are small. And also in frequency, they are really far off. Okay? So kind of the conclusion is now, um, so for everything I will uh, cover in these lectures, and you know, for most 99% of, or 95% of trapped physics, you can really think about the dynamics, uh, also the quantum dynamics of this oscillator, of this ion, as a harmonic oscillator, which is now trapped in all three directions. If at some stage, you know, you might want to do some experiments with trapped ions, or really want to work in detail on some theory proposals, you might keep in mind that there are corrections, which you Come important that if you have high frequencies, electric fields offset, or simply if the ion moves a lot, you know, then it's motion goes up. Okay, so given the fact that, okay, so let's let's believe for now that we this draft ion is really on the proper like oscillator, uh, how can we manipulate it? And for this we use uh, laser fields, uh, different optical systems. So maybe this is now, I uh, mean this has been essentially colored in the First introduction lecture, so now have this trapped uh, ion. We for now assume that there are two internal states. We drive it with a near resonant laser. So this is the typical now interaction. So position dipole moment coupled to the electric field. If you plug in the electric field of a running wave, for example, okay, we get this, this type of uh, so here is the Rabi frequency as, as we defined, and then the times cosine of the T. And what the I mean, often neglect in computer systems is that this, of course, now also depends on the position of the iron. Okay? And this will be important. 
So just again to repeat these two steps because they appear now over and over in this lecture. Okay, so starting from this, this undependent Hamiltonian, what we do, we move the rotating frame. So essentially we have this laser frequency. The only interest in, in our case is how much the, the frequency of the uh, excited state differs from this laser frequency, which is described by this delta. Uh, we, okay, now we get all these time dependencies here in these operators. And as the second step we do on time conformatics Assume we know this is a large frequency, our dynamics is very small, so we neglect everything that is fast from dating in this combination. So in this sense, uh, the essence of this whole thing, now it's fit into a one-dimensional system. So this is kind of really the, the work, the Newtonian the work cause of our system, the harmonic oscillator. We have the excited state energy, so it's only uh, here the tuning that matters. And we have this uh, raising and lowering operators with the Rabi frequency, and they contain is position dependent phase patterns. Okay, so this uh, I think after, especially after lecture, the lecture on Thursday, I think this should be clear. So uh, the important thing is uh, to realize so that this, you know, this Hamiltonian is general form. I mean, it's still still complicated, even if it looks very very simple. And the thing that uh, allows us to do a lot of the nice stuff in, in, in this trapped ions is the following uh, observation that if I, I cool my ion you know, close to the ground set in the regime rate that we're interested in, the extent of this, the, the motion of the ion is about uh, you know, a few times the ground state size. And this, for these large trapping uh, frequencies, is in the order of a few tens of nanometers. Is yeah. this the motion of ground state? This is the motion of ground state, yeah. So on the other hand, we have our laser lights, so the wavelength of this light, which is you know, typically a few hundred nanometers. Okay? So in this sense, we can, it's very, you can see really. Um, so here we have, uh, we can define the so-called Lambdicke parameter, okay, a very uh, important concept in quantum optics, which is simply the, the rate, so here you see better, the ratio of the ground, ground state extension over the uh, laser wavelength. Okay? And in distract ion systems, this is usually much smaller than one. So this means, okay, that the ion is always tightly confined compared to the extent of the wavelength. I mean, maybe another uh, alternative description of or interpretation of this Lambdicke parameter. So if I, you know, kind of uh, square this expression, so put in this a naught there, I can rearrange it and write it something like, you know, so so this guy, so this is the uh, the photon, um, photon momentum squared over 2m. So this is kind of a recoil energy. So every time the, uh, the ion emits a photon or absorbs a photon, this is the kind of energy it picks up from the photon recoil. And divided by now the trap level spacing. And again, having this very small means that you know, the, the energy I get from a single photon absorption is actually small compared to my trap. So it has a little effect. So in the end, again, so this Lambdicke limit is either the limit of strong confinement, or you can also, you know, kind of say a little, uh, you can use it as essentially uh, the limit of weak radiation action on the atom. And while you know, often you think about a case of radiation back action, this is something you want to use for cooling, for you know, do interesting stuff. Usually you want to have it high. It's actually kind of this weak, you know, weak of course. Uh, in, in this sense this weak uh, light action regime that allows us to do a lot of stuff. So let us now, okay, again, take this Hamiltonian and place this k times z here in an exponent. Now simplify this eta operator and a plus a dagger. So the position is simply uh, a plus a dagger. And again, in general, you know, you see that it, it, this a and a dagger are in the exponents. In principle, this is a Hamiltonian which contains all all powers of this A and A dagger, so in principle it's very complicated. But now in this particular limit, and this is when this eta is small, or more precisely, you know, when it's occupied, okay, the whole motional extent of this wave function is smaller than one. I can expand this guy, and okay, so if I take the zero order, you know, this thing simply vanishes, and I get my driven, driven two level system. Okay, but simple. If I expand the next order, I get my two level system times the position operator, a and a dagger, and, and so on. 
So the okay, so the, the to visualize I mean, what's going on in the system, it's always useful to to draw this, this type of level diagram. So you see this a lot in if you uh, look at the iron papers. So so here I just simply you know plot the, the motionless, so the atom in the ground state, and here different motional levels. So spacing here is going to make a uh, tracking frequency, and here is the excited state, and again different trap levels. So now these these terms I just listed here. Okay, so this is the zero quarter term, which you know doesn't involve any motion, so it will just couple two level system. The next term it involves motion and can either annihilate uh, a quanta when the system is excited or create a quanta when the system is excited. So this will now starting here, for example, it will create transition to this state or transitions to this state. So the ground and excited is an internal atom state? The ground and excited, yeah. yeah. So these are the, the two level, the uh, ground electronic state, uh, excited electronic state. So this always is the laser, laser frequency. Okay. And in this direction is the different motional states. And again, so here, for example, you have a sigma plus, so you go up, and at you know, the same time you remove it. So, and, and again, so you see there's, there's different parts of ether, ether is small, so this transition in general is, is, I mean, is smaller than, than this, uh, this direct transition. And okay, higher order terms, in principle, they're always present, but they are now still at ether squared, the higher parts of ether, so in this regime, we can, to the most extent, neglect them. So, um, okay, so, so what, uh, maybe now the next step, I mean, what uh, do we do? So, uh, again, there's this, so let's take again this Hamiltonian, try to, to simplify or uh, just discuss it. And in this case, this then, um, it's always uh, uh, convenient again to do kind of this, take this bare Hamiltonian, so just these energy levels, transform away, away these bare energy levels, so this is just a, the, uh, the relation just go in a rotating frame, this whole Hamiltonian, and look only, so in action pictures, in other words, look only at this type of interaction, which now, of course, picks up all this time dependence. So we are transforming away the mechanical frequency and the, the, the energy level. So this sigma plus operators, for example, pick up this, this oscillation phase with delta, and the A operators pick up this oscillation phase with uh, omega. So again, this is uh, still quite complicated, but let's expand it in a Dicke parameter. And now we get a series of terms, so you know, let's keep the zero order and the first order. And now all these terms, uh, of course, uh, due to these different combinations, uh, oscillate in time, but with different frequencies. Okay, and we have this first, this bare time term, which is simply the, the tuning. We have this uh, single plus operator with an annihilation operator, which is now the tuning plus omega t, and the other one is the tuning minus omega t. So the, the reasoning we now see is the same as you usually do with the rotating wave approximation. So we neglect fast oscillating terms. We assume that this guy in front, where there's a heat, no, no, okay. okay, this guy in front is smaller than all these oscillation frequencies. But now you know instead of having just one frequency, we can actually by tuning this delta, we can select which of these terms is resonant. Okay, so that's that's uh, the main ideas here. And now if I uh, look what's uh, uh, what's going on, so let's for example set uh, delta equal to zero, so the really have a resonant laser with the GE transition. Then we simply see so we have this bare interaction term which is resonant. And we simply drive the two-level system without detecting the motion. Okay, so this will just create the standard gravity oscillation. The motion of the state doesn't play over. So now let's go to uh, uh, just to mention that this. I mean, if I drive such a laser transition, I usually uh, people talk about the sort of carrier transition. Okay, that's the term that's used in this drive high business. So I can now uh, uh, detune my laser. So I have the laser frequency slightly lower in the, uh, in the, um, the resonance condition, and I have a lower by the, by the track frequency. So now this, this transition where I remove a phonon 
analysis of the lower energy, the entire transition becomes resonant. And in this case, in the so-called right, uh, red siphon regime, uh, using this red siphon transition, I maximize this interaction or make this resonant, this, this type of process resonant, with, and I gain just the usual change coming from. Okay? So with this I can use the graph ion to simulate something like the atom in the cavity. But of course I can also do the other two tuning, so now I go to the blue regime, so I have the frequency of the laser larger than, than the traffic frequency, and I get simply the anti chain comes called. Yeah. So it's, uh, in, in the red side phase transition, uh, why is it more likely to go from excited in level N to ground in level N than to go back to N plus one and excited in red side band? So I see uh, lower N, so, but uh, it doesn't seem like it's cool unless it drops down to N. Yeah, so, so here I'm, I'm still talking, so there's no cooling involved, there's oh. all coherent interactions, okay? Okay. So the, 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 the system here is long lived for, for this purposes, it's just made now oscillate forth and back. Okay, so these are the, these, these, these sort of the main processes we have available in the system. And of course, I can, you know, have a laser field, so I can, you know, it's not something fixed, so I can, uh, you know, one time make this, this carry transition, next time may make this pulse. And of course, I can also, you know, let's take two lasers, one tuned to the, the blue side band, one to the red side band, and I get a combination of these, these systems, okay? Okay, so this is uh, kind of the type of coherent detection, and now coming to your question. Okay, what about dissipation? Okay, which I've detected so far. So dissipation, of course, in the system, collateral systems, comes very naturally in terms of spontaneous emission. So so far, I talked about driving this, this two-level system. Of course, once it's in the excited state, then decay down and emit photons. So now, uh, I mean, making here kind of this this analogy that this quantum jump approach, which we were in the, in the beginning. So, I mean, how to think about it, so at first some, some wave function, uh, once this photon is emitted, it undergoes a quantum jump. So it will be, the wave function will be projected on the ground state. But, you know, so, so here we have, let's say, in the solid state system, superconductive qubit, you know, it will just go down. But the atom emits quite high energy photon, so, and due to the photon recoil, you know, it will get this, get yeah, also a kick when going down. And this, of course, depends now on the direction of photon is emitted and so on. So we can, I mean, now uh, use a master equation to describe this, this system. And uh, so I hope you're still kind of uh, familiar with, with master equations. So we have uh, we, uh, the evolution of, of the density matrix now evolves for you to write it in terms of a effective Hamiltonian. So this simply means it evolves according to Hamiltonian, and if the, the system is in excited state, so this part of the excited state you know, decays, so this is an imaginary part, so it's not unitary pollution, it simply decays. And then of course, I mean, the whole system uh, wave function, is a condensation tendency goes to simply zero. So you can think about this as eventually, whenever there's photon emitted, you have this sort of recycling terms, so it, it decays and will be reconnected in the ground state. And if I now insert, I mean, usually it just have here a sigma minus sigma plus, but including now this photon recoil, and now have also this, this you know, uh, whenever it goes, uh, simply goes, goes down, you will give this recoil. And okay, there is, you know, depending, for example, if I have type of tr transition, there's a certain probability to be emitted in all directions, and this is now captured here in this, in this file n, and I have to average over all angles. Okay, so simply this averaging of more directions. So, uh, I mean, I can, uh, for most purposes, I can actually make a small simplification. So I'm only interested in, in motion along one direction. So, uh, I mean, the photon is emitted in this direction. You know, the relevant recoil kick I, I get is just a projection on the z-axis. So I can simply rewrite now this three-dimensional integral in something where I define u, so the cosine of, of this angle, which appears here. Then I get a new type of emission pattern, but otherwise not. Okay, so this is just how likely is that the photon uh, get a photon recoil kick in this direction. Okay, so uh, now to get an interpretation, what what does this this term now do in our system? 
So let's again go back to our Lintiki uh, limit and uh, rewrite this recycling terms now in terms of this Lintiki parameter. And again, let's uh, okay, assume this uh, uh, system is in excited state. Let's start to expand this expression. So if I take the zero of all term, this distribution is normalized. So it simply adds up to one, and I just get my usual decay. Okay, so that's the term you write, exactly the term you write in your master equation for the usual two level system. So then I have the, the first order term. Uh, I have some stuff here. It doesn't really matter because you know the first order is proportional to u, so this is uh, kind of a certain direction because the, the emission is now uniform in all directions, so this simply averages out. Okay, so there's no net force on the asset. Then I get the second order term, okay, so uh, which uh, I expand. Uh, there's a coefficient alpha, you know, it doesn't really matter, it's just some related to this never factor related to this distribution function. And I get now from okay from these terms, I get now an effect also on the motion. And you see in these terms I get this, this set bar which I define here. So this is uh, I treat A and A dagger on the equal footing. So this simply means, okay, if the atom is excited, you know, the, the, the emission of the photon doesn't really care if I, if I, if I decay to a state which has a plus, minus, a megahertz energy difference, okay? So these terms now need, uh, I mean, they cause transition when the, the atom decays. You can also change the motion of state. This effect is reduced by, by parameter the square. But it's the same in both directions, okay? So it doesn't lead to net cooling, it doesn't lead to uh, net heating. It simply means that the distribution of the at, uh, if you start from end, you know, the distribution will simply uh, diffuse over time. So this, this is a kind of a real diffusion term, okay? So which doesn't correspond to a net value. So this now kind of, uh, kind of now in the, in the picture summarized, okay, the main processes Einfeld once we include the uh, diffusion, okay? So we had kind of this expression from before, so we can have processes where I go, I mean, now I drive the system weekly with the laser field, I can go to this red, make this red cycle transition, and then decay on the carrier, okay? So this will overall remove a consequences from the system, so it will correspond to cooling. There's another term I just uh, tried to motivate, so I decide the atom, and when it decays, okay, if it just decays, it doesn't do anything, but it can decay and have this recoil kick and pick up or free or loose or uh, pick up another quantum. Then, of course, I have the, the opposite regime where I now have this transition, which could, uh, uh, my excitation creates a phonon, and then I simply decay, and this is a DD. Okay, so these are the, the kind of processes that, that are relevant in this Dantic regime, when, I mean, of course, higher order processes, but they are very small. So you can do something, so I don't go here to the derivation, but just to, um, to, to summarize this, in case you can now do a rigorous derivation for you know, integrating out this excited state. So just do a description for the motional state, how it evolves. You get some effect in the master equation. If you remember, you know, from, so there are these terms which go like A, A and A dagger here. If you remember from Monday, so this is something which, which overall leads to cooling lowers the occupation number, the opposite term corresponds to ED. So you can uh, evaluate these terms, and again, you essentially see here are the Lorentians, which now depend on delta and uh, this different um, process, so you have this inter interpretation. So if delta is minus omega, this cooling term is very high, while the other, while the, the heating term and the diffusion terms are suppressed. Okay, so that's and just okay again to do everything here, just the uh, pictures. So then, of course, you recover. I mean, this was discussed now uh, a few times. Uh, depending now on the line width of your uh, state. So if the line width is very large, much larger than the, 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 the level splitting here, you know, all these individual trans transitions are essentially not resolved. They're all the same because the line is so broad. Okay, so. I mean, there's still a small preference in going this direction or in this direction, but this is very small, and in the end you end up with a net cooling, but a final temperature which is still much larger than one. So where gamma or omega t is still much larger than one, 
and this corresponds to Doppler cooling. Okay, Doppler cooling can go into the ground state. Then, of course, there's the other regime where this uh, upper line width is very narrow. So now, I mean, if I tune here a resonance, you know, it, it, this, this uh, dissipation is very far suppressed. So you dominantly go in this direction, you dominantly do, do cooling. In this uh, so called cyclic cooling regime, you can really go to very low. So the final dissipation number is this gamma or omega squared. So you can really go to lower dissipation numbers. And now this is also, you know, compared to the current state of optimal mechanics, where, you know, it's happy to reach n a little bit smaller than one. So in real experiments, you know, this is really essentially zero up to the point where you can measure it. Okay? So this is really an efficient way to pair atoms in the ground state. Are there any questions at this stage or was that just go on? So so far okay, so this so, is kind so of why is it that they can cool ions to the ground state but mechanical systems not yet? What is the key reason? Uh, so, yeah, so on one hand, there is a. Okay, so here, I, and this I probably show in the next lecture, I mean, you can actually design your numbers, so you can have very small line width. I mean, so this limit is essentially zero. And the other thing is simply that in optical mechanical systems, you have heating from your thermal reservoir. Okay? And here, so there's no, no other heating source involved. So it's the frequency. The, no, so the, the, the heating from the phonon back. Right, but here, here, is, isn't it so that the frequency of these transitions are so, uh, so much higher than in mechanical systems? I don't know. No, so the optical the transition doesn't... No, 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 the mechanical. No. Uh, I mean, it, this is also megahertz, so in this sense you don't, don't win. No, but, so, so here, for example, the, the, I mean, in this, this simple description, the cooling rate doesn't matter, okay? Because I right. don't have a reservoir I couple to. And in mechanics, you always have the cooling rate has to be much larger than the reheating from the re reservoir, and not and not from. So here, are just the intrinsic effect from this uh, imperfection of, of going to the blue side band, and this in principle can be very very small. And in mechanics.